Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this talk. My name is Kenneth Shinazuka. I'm a PhD student actually right here in Oxford University, so this is home turf for me. Uh, I work with Professor Morten Kringlebach. And today I'm going to talk to you about a comprehensive meta-analysis of psychedelic research. So firstly, what are psychedelics? Uh, psychedelics are ancient hallucinogenic substances um, that induce profound alterations in consciousness. They include ayahuasca, whose primary psychoactive ingredient is DMT, uh, LSD, and psilocybin, more commonly known as magic mushrooms. Um, there was an initial burst of research in the West on psychedelics in the 1950s and 1960s, showing the promise of psychedelics for treating various psychiatric disorders. Um, that research was then suppressed uh, after the war on drugs and the criminalization of these substances. But recently, there has been re-emerging research on the profound therapeutic effects of these substances. And the reason why psychedelics relate to the topic of this conference is that they're excellent tools for understanding consciousness. And the reason why is that they're able to induce these profound alterations of consciousness in a controlled experimental setting. You can give psychedelics to somebody, reliably expect that they're going to change their consciousness, uh, even if they are not familiar with psychedelics. In fact, um, the more new that they are to psychedelics, the more profound the effects are likely to be. Unlike, for example, practices like meditation, where you might require uh, extended practice in order to notice changes to consciousness. So the topic of today's talk is going to be a meta-analysis of psychedelic research. And in particular, I'm going to look at three different levels of analysis. The first is phenomenology, or the subjective experience of psychedelics. For example, the experience of oneness, or interconnectedness, or ego death. The second is captured through neuroimaging. Uh, and there are in particular three different metrics of brain activity that are used in the fMRI literature on psychedelics, uh, bold activation, functional connect connect connectivity, uh, and entropy. And finally, at the bottom of this so-called hierarchy, which I think, by the way, is more of a feedback loop than a hierarchy, uh, is the pharmacology of psychedelics, how psychedelics interact with different receptors in the brain. Uh, and in one particular receptor of interest is the 5-HG2A receptor, or the serotonin 2A receptor, um, which, if blocked with certain antagonists, uh, completely eliminates the subjective experiences of psychedelics. So, again, to summarize, these are the three levels of analysis, the phenomenology, neuroimaging, and pharmacology. Now, by way of analogy, we can think about these three different levels of analysis in terms of traffic. So, the uh, receptors at the pharmacological level play the role of traffic signs, rerouting the flow of neural dynamics in the brain. The neuroimaging captures the actual traffic itself, the flow of information through the brain. And finally, the traffic gives rise to subjective experiences like the feeling of being stuck in traffic during rush hour, which if you're from Southern California like me, is a very everyday subjective experience. Okay, so Here's the overview of the meta-analysis. It's the first meta-analysis of all three hierarchical levels of analysis of phenomenology, neuroimaging, and pharmacology. And we quantitatively compare three different psychedelics at each level, uh, ayahuasca slash DMT, LSD, and psilocybin. And in order to enable comparison across all three levels of analysis, we determine the profile of each level, where we basically determine the alignment between the uh, neural fingerprints at each level and the seven resting state Yo networks, which include things like the visual network, the default mode network, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's begin with the top of the hierarchy, which is phenomenology. So this meta-analysis consisted of two parts. The first was a meta-analysis of uh, questionnaire data from 33 different studies. And the questionnaire in particular that we use in this meta-analysis is the altered states of consciousness scale, both the five-dimensional and 11-dimensional versions. The altered states of consciousness scale um, measures subjective experience along a specific number of dimensions, either 5 or 11. Um, the five-dimensional version is capturing uh, oceanic boundlessness, which broadly relates to feelings of interconnectedness, uh, anxious ego dissolution, uh, visionary restructuralization, which captures the quality and intensity of visual hallucinations, um, auditory alterations, and reduction of vigilance. Very poetic names for describing these different subjective categories. So what do we find? I apologize that the text is a bit small. Um, so on the upper left here, you can see the five different dimensions um, in the Altered States of Consciousness questionnaire. And one striking finding is that we uh, don't really see that many significant differences between the different psychedelics. Uh, 
There's only one significant difference, and that's between uh, LSD and psilocybin in the visionary restructuralization dimension, which again is capturing primarily the quality and intensity uh, of hallucinations. Now, this broadly tracks with another study that was recently done in Switzerland, where both LSD and psilocybin um, were given to the same group of participants, and participants couldn't tell the difference between LSD and psilocybin at the peak of the trip. And furthermore, when they were asked to retrospectively um, rate their subjective experience along this scale, uh, there were also no significant differences observed between the drugs. But it is interesting to note that even though the differences aren't significant, um, LSD tends to have higher scores along all these dimensions than the other two drugs. We do see more significant differences when we do within-drug comparisons looking across the different uh, dimensions of the scale. And in particular, um, the visual aspect of psychedelics uh, tends to receive much higher scores than every other dimension. Okay, now we also wanted to identify the neural fingerprints of the phenomenology of psychedelics in order to compare them to the different levels of the hierarchy. And the problem with the uh, altered states of consciousness questionnaire is that it's quite hard to determine the neural correlates of those dimensions. I mean, what, what exactly are the neural correlates of oceanic boundlessness? It's kind of hard to say. Um, so instead, we looked to another study uh, by Hayes and colleagues in 2022, um, which examined the neural correlates of 11 categories of subjective experience that are more well-defined, uh, things like affective processing, uh, social processing, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we plug those categories into a tool called Neurosynth, which basically does an automated meta-analysis, uh, finding different clusters of bold activation that correlate with those categories of experience. And um, when we do this, we find that the neural fingerprints are actually very similar across the different psychedelics, kind of indistinguishable. Okay, so now let's move on to the second level of the hierarchy, which is neuroimaging. And as I mentioned earlier, neuroimaging can be broken down into three components, the bold activation, the functional connectivity, uh, and the entropy. So we'll first start with the bold activation. Um, so these are, broadly speaking, just areas of the brain that go up or down in activity um, when you take psychedelics. And oftentimes, in a lot of these experiments, uh, participants also have to perform tasks um, while they're on psychedelics. And these tasks span a very broad range of behaviors, ranging from uh, you know, social processing to um, inhibition of motor activity, and so on and so forth. So we take those peak coordinates of bold activity from these studies, um, and then we input them into a software called Ginger Ale, which is able to compute the common clusters of bold activity. Um, here are those clusters for LSD and psilocybin and for the entire data set. Um, and interestingly, we find that LSD seems to uh, affect activity more in the default mode network, whereas psilocybin affects it more in the visual network. But I would strongly uh, urge against extrapolating from the results of, these study, the results of this meta-analysis. Uh, I think we had too few studies in this case uh, to meaningfully disambiguate the different psychedelics. And in particular, the, uh, the tasks probably strongly confound the results. So for example, with the psilocybin data set, we only had four studies. Three of those um, uh, used a visual task, so that's probably why we see uh, more activity in the visual network as opposed to other networks. Okay, then let's move on to functional connectivity, which is basically analyzing correlations uh, between different regions of interest uh, in the brain. So what we did in this meta-analysis is we assigned those uh, regions of interest uh, to the seven resting state yo networks, which then results in a seven by seven matrix telling you about the uh, average connectivity between different yo networks across all the different studies. So on the left here, you see that matrix for all the different studies. <clears throat> and then on the right, uh, you see functional connectivity for each of the three uh, different psychedelics. Um, now, one finding that is of particular interest here is that we find an increase in connectivity within the default mode network, um, which appears to contradict um, a lot of uh, findings in literature which consistently show uh, decreases in connectivity within the default mode network and then try to tie that um, finding to subjective experiences of ego dissolution. The reason being that uh, the default mode network is uh, classically responsible for self-rumination, um, self-related thinking, uh, and all sorts of other self-related processes. Um, and in my opinion, it's not actually a contradiction. Uh, what we find is that different analyses in the literature show different results. Um, so if you look at individual nodes within the default mode network, you find this increase in connectivity, whereas if you average across the entire default mode network, you see a decrease in activity, which points to the, this idea that there might be islands of local increases in connectivity within the default mode network, even if there are global decreases in that network. Okay, and then finally, there's the entropy. Um, I conducted a qualitative review on this due to the diversity of methods, um, and I won't get into the detail, details of that today. <clears throat> 
Okay, now we get to the bottom of the hierarchy, which is pharmacology. So um, before I talk about the results, it's important to provide some necessary background about pharmacology. So we focus on two different aspects of pharmacology. The first is the binding affinity. So basically how strongly these drugs bind to different receptors in the brain. But binding affinity isn't everything because you might have a drug or a chemical that binds very strongly to a receptor, but doesn't actually induce much of a response. It doesn't cause the receptor to be very active once the drug is actually bound to the receptor. So there's an entirely separate uh, aspect of pharmacology uh, known as functional activity, which again is broadly asking the question of uh, does the drug or chemical elicit a response in the receptor? And the functional activity that is of particular interest in the case of psychedelics um, is uh, cellular signaling mediated by uh, GPCRs or G-protein coupled receptors. So most serotonin receptors, including the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, are these G-protein coupled receptors. And in particular, the reason why these are, this is relevant to the action of psychedelics um, is that certain, it is hypothesized that certain uh, G-protein signaling mechanisms are able to induce hallucinations, uh, as in the case of uh, psychedelics like LSD. Um, whereas others are not. So uh, lyceride is uh, another chemical that also binds very strongly to the 5-HE2A receptor. Um, but uh, critically, it doesn't induce any hallucinations in spite of the fact that it has a strong affinity for this receptor. And it's hypothesized that that's because of the fact that it activates different G-protein G uh, signaling mechanisms uh, and, other mecha and other cellular signaling mechanisms than psychedelics do. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, meta-analysis on the binding affinity. So we looked at DMT, LSD, and psilocin's affinity for six different receptors, including uh, four serotonin receptors uh, and two dopamine receptors. Uh, we unfortunately weren't able to uh, do statistics on this because of the fact that there was a large range of sampling errors, um, or sorry, standard errors in the literature. But what you broadly find um, is that LSD has uh, much higher affinity, orders of magnitude higher affinity than the other two drugs. It's important to note that um, the y-axis here inversely corresponds to affinity. So the lower the bar, the higher the affinity actually is. And this is a logarithmic scale. So again, you see these orders of magnitude higher affinity uh, of LSD for these receptors um, than the other drugs. Uh, and you also see across all the psychedelics more affinity for the serotonin receptors than you do to the dopamine receptors. Uh, and generally it's the case that uh, these drugs uh, bind with the highest affinity to the serotonin 2A receptor, which is consistent with this idea that the serotonin 2A receptor plays an important role in the action of psychedelics. Uh, based on this, uh, we came up with the pharmacology profile of each of these, um, of each of these psychedelics which is basically the binding affinity multiplied by the relative expression of that receptor in the seven different YO networks. And because of the fact that LSD's affinity is disproportionately higher than that of the other psychedelics, um, you see this much more, quote unquote, extensive pharmacology profile for LSD than you do for the other two drugs. Okay, but then we look at the Functional activity, which again is whether or not um, the psychedelics are eliciting a response in the receptors that they bind to. And uh, I won't go too deep into the weeds here because there's, there's a lot of pharmacology and cellular biology involved. But broadly speaking, there are these two different uh, classes of signaling mechanisms that we looked at. On the left here, you see the recruitment of these proteins called beta arrestin 2s. And then on the right uh, are these mechanisms that underlie uh, G protein uh, signaling. And the only significant difference that we found is that uh, in this one metric of G-protein signaling, uh, DMT uh, elicits much less activity. Again, there's this inverse relationship between the y-axis and, and activity. DMT elicits much less activity through this um, pathway than um, LSD and psilocin. Now, that's of particular interest because um, DMT, unlike the other two psychedelics, uh, binds very strongly to the sigma-2 receptor uh, in addition to the 5-H2A receptor. And the sigma-2 receptor is a very mysterious receptor. Um, we don't know exactly uh, what its cellular signaling mechanisms are, but whatever it is, it's definitely not a G-protein coupled receptor. Um, so it definitely doesn't activate um, the signaling pathways. And that seems to suggest, suggest that DMT, unlike the other two psychedelics, um, might actually uh, activate alternative signaling pathways. Uh, and this could be the reason why uh, DMT uh, phenomenologically is different from LSD and psilocybin in terms of the breakthrough experience. Of course, again, in, in the, uh, in, in the meta-analysis, um, we actually didn't find significant differences. Um, but I think that you know, if, you, if you use different scales, you actually would uh, find it because DMT is, is a completely different beast. Um,
Okay, so now let's synthesize all the different results across the uh, three levels of the hierarchy. Again, we had phenomenology, um, neuroimaging, and pharmacology. Um, what is the main takeaway from this? Of course, we can't really do a one-to-one -one comparison between these different levels of the hierarchy. I mean, all these different plots, in spite of the fact that they are standardized here, are measuring very, very different things. Um, but what it does point to is this highly complex and nonlinear interaction between the three different levels of the hierarchy. Um, there is unlikely one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, which of course we all need to begin with, right? Uh, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. But this is further highlighting the point that, that, that there is a highly nonlinear and complex relationship um, between these different substances. Okay, so you probably have noticed that I've barely talked about consciousness at all during this presentation. Uh, what is this talk doing at this conference? So um, now I'll try to uh, begin to relate everything back uh, to consciousness. The reason why uh, psychedelics um, uh, fascinated me to begin with was that they are extraordinary tools for studying consciousness. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you're able to reliably induce altered states of consciousness in a controlled experimental setting. Uh, and in particular, psychedelics are these really interesting instruments because on the one hand, they have a known chemical structure. Uh, we know exactly uh, what molecules are present inside uh, each of these different drugs. Uh, but on the other hand, they seem to give rise to these uh, immaterial experiences, these ineffable spiritual experiences of interconnectedness and oneness. So you have this uh, very sort of rigidly defined molecule that is able to give rise to these seemingly uh, seemingly immaterial experiences. Okay, but let's let's talk about the meta-analysis and how it relates to consciousness. Um, so we saw that the phenomenology is broadly similar across psychedelics. Again, we didn't see these significant differences um, in the altered states of consciousness questionnaire. Um, but the neuroimaging and the pharmacology are not, um, which seems to be suggesting um, that there is some kind of unification across different uh, neural communication uh, and pharmacological or cellular signaling pathways that then leads to this broadly uh, unified experience. Um, the other thing is that uh, while it's classically thought that the 5-HT2A receptor in the brain is the key actor that mediates the psychoactive effects of psychedelics, meta-analysis reveals that there are probably um, other pharmacological mechanisms too. And this is relating to what I was telling you earlier about functional activity. In particular, um, the, the signaling that occurs through the 5-HT2A receptor um, via these uh, G proteins uh, and beta arrestin proteins. Um, what's really interesting is that LSD has no hallucinogenic effects um, if beta arrestin recruitment is knocked out, suggesting that this cellular signaling pathway might play a key role in mediating the psychoactive effects uh, of LSD. There's also some interesting research that shows that um, uh, antipsychotic medications uh, target the interaction between um, beta arrestin 2 proteins uh, and dopamine receptors. Uh, now, why is that relevant for psychedelics? Well, when psychedelics first burst out on the scene in psych psychiatry um, back in the mid-20th century, uh, they were modeled as psychotomimetics, um, as drugs that are principally useful for modeling psychosis. Um, now, I disagree with this idea that, that psychedelics are just models of psychosis. I think there are a lot more, but I do think it's a good starting point. And if it is true that these antipsychotics uh, primarily target the interaction of these beta arrestin proteins and dopamine receptors, that does suggest that there is some kind of role that the, this protein might play in mediating um, the psychosis-like effects uh, of psychedelics. Um, and LSD binds much more strongly to the dopamine receptors than the other two psychedelics, which might explain why we see this um, slightly higher uh, intensity of subjective effects uh, in LSD uh, and slightly higher intensity of hallucinations, in particular in LSD, than in the um, other two drugs. That's it. Thank you very much.